is 5.05. And uh, I will open the planning board meeting. And here's Mary. And I guess we're going to reopen the public hearing. And this time we'll reopen the public hearing, which was continued from Brent. Oh boy. Um, 25th? 25th? Yes, that's right. <laughs> okay, somewhere here up there to agenda. So what I recall is there were there was the issue about the energy plan and about moving the driveway and dealing with the apron to conform with Waitley driveway regulations. So I guess Chris, you want to kind of catch us up on on the outstanding issues? Sure. Let's take that second one first because it's much simpler. Um, I am going to, you can share your screen, share that. I'm sure I've got the correct thing showing here. Um, so yes, uh, oh, along with initial review of the plans that we had submitted for the project, the highway department had highlighted that the driveway, which was really just an upgrade of the existing driveway on the property, um, did not meet the um, town driveway standards in two respects. Um, and I'm actually gonna move to sheet two, which is a better blow up. Uh, those being um, that the apron area within 20 feet of the roadway pavement uh, needs to be paved in asphalt we had proposed gravel and that the uh, location of the driveway was to be at least 20 feet off of the adjacent property um, so as to avoid conflicts. And my screen does not seem to be refreshing very well right now. So that didn't help much. Let's see if I can. My technology jinx is. Just... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, there we go. There we go. Um, and so, as was mentioned, I had uh, revised these plans a couple of weeks ago, intended to send them to the board, uh, but just realized tonight that I hadn't previously, so I did submit them earlier today. Um, but these plans were just um, revised to change the location of the driveway here, and as demonstrated with a 20-foot offset to the property line, and then a 20-foot uh, minimum width of asphalt paving um, at the mouth of this driveway, um, certainly no, no issues with providing that. Um, and then as part of the application, we had identified that we wanted to adjust some of the plantings. Um, I think I had uh, mentioned a few of the species that had been discussed, but essentially uh, in conversation with the immediate na neighbor, Tim Smith, there was concern that these plants would be shading uh, mm -hmm. some of his crop on the very southern edge of his site, um, and so requested that we provide shorter plantings uh, while still um, screening the fence appropriately. Um, and so in place of the uh, river birch and American holly, which uh, are, while not huge, uh, do eventually get relatively large, um, we've uh, asked our landscape architects to suggest uh, some other species, um, and this is left with a little bit of flexibility, um, but a minimum, the same minimum number of plants uh, to be a mixture of species uh, to maximize screening and also blend in uh, with the landscape. Uh, we've uh, included uh, some some somewhat shorter species and a mix of both um, uh, evergreen and deciduous trees, uh, just so that we don't have. Uh, the little soldier line of arborvitae that a lot of sites provide. Uh, we have specified as one option, uh, one variety of arborvitae, the red cedar kind, uh, which is uh, a little bit um, 
less formal than than the, the really columnar shaped ones that you usually see. This is the one that's that's uh, you know a little bit more natural looking. Um, so the is it, the, is it more deer resistant? <laughs> I don't know if anything is more is is deer resistant, um, but um, uh, yeah, I, I can't comment specifically on that. Uh, we are uh, we did exchange the American holly, which gets quite tall, with a blue princess holly, which is a little bit lower growing and more shrubbier, um, and that I think is really good um, with with the deer. The other ones, I I I'm not the right person to comment, unfortunately. But that's always a challenge with any planting. It certainly is. Um, so that is the response to the to the one question about the driveway. Um, and then the the more substantive uh, set of comments was on the discussion on energy last week, uh, last week, last month. Um, and essentially, we were left, you know, with with direction on two different things um, to provide a rough estimate of total energy use. Um, and not just the peak usage, which is what we had focused our initial submission on, um, and then to address a little bit more directly the 50% the on-site generation goal that's in the bylaw. Um, and, you know, as, as I would put it, essentially, we were sent back to do a little bit more homework. Um, and we have uh, last week uh, submitted a narrative that we put together uh, that addresses this in a little bit more detail. And, you know, without uh, certainly happy to discuss the details, but without going through total exhaustive detail on, on what's been submitted in writing, uh, just want to talk generally and then hit some key points. Um, you know, one of our um, sort of primary thoughts in this conversation um, last month was the fact that growing within the greenhouse to begin with really was a key component of energy. Um, in terms of the site and, you know, uh, from the sort of uh, selfish private developer standpoint, it's about the cost of energy, but, um, but the reality is that growing in a greenhouse does have a significantly lower energy profile because it is making use of direct sunlight, um, but admittedly, um, in the conversation last week, uh, we were a little, can I keep saying last week, last month, uh, our presentation was a little more qualitative and I would say even a bit hand wavy at times on, on some of that. And so we took that question seriously about, uh, you know, how much energy are we talking about? Uh, how much energy is the site going to use? How much electricity is it going to use? And what does that represent in terms of on site? Um, and so we approached this uh, through a couple of different ways. You know, the, the first, you know, the, the overarching thread through this discussion, I would say, is the important concept that in growing the plants, there's a certain amount of energy input that's required. And, you know, the bylaw sort of acknowledges this in the waiver that it provides for the outdoor grow operation, the true outdoor grow operation without any supplemental lighting. And I think that that's, uh, you know, a sensible place to have a waiver. Um, and what goes unsaid there is because all, virtually all of the energy going to the plants in that outdoor setting are coming from the sun and is not a use of electricity. And then on the other extreme is the, the what I'll, what I'll call fully true indoor setting where the grow operation is happening totally cut off from the outside environment and all of the energy inputs that go into the plant is 100% coming from some kind of artificial energy input, uh, primarily electricity going into artificial lighting. And the use of the greenhouse grow which in the industry is often referred to as a hybrid grow, which sort of gets at the point, is that the purpose of that is to make use of some direct sunlight energy and some artificial energy input. And so then the question is, well, you know, what does that mean quantitatively? And so we approach this two different ways. One of them, which I'm showing you here, is the site-specific and DMCTC operationally specific <laughs> Um, uh, analysis of, of that usage. And so this is the proposed lighting plan for the facility. And the way this chart breaks down is 
we've got each of the 24 hours of the day on the left hand side and each of the 12 months of the year going down below and each of these columns represents what is happening in these greenhouses in a particular month yeah. and the life cycle of the plants in this facility runs on a three-month cycle um, uh, roughly speaking um, uh, with, with a little bit of of um, uh, change over time on the ends uh, and they look at it in terms of weeks but uh, roughly speaking there's one month in what's known as the vegetative grow state where the baby plants are maturing um, but have not flowered yet and during that point in time the plants need 18 hours of sunlight or of, of light input during the day and that is followed by two months of flowering um, periods where uh, the light requirement is for 12 hours. And so this, which is a simplified version um, of the plan, shows the plants going through those cycles over the course of a year. Uh, you know, sort of simplified here is the fact that simultaneously there are groups of plants that are in different life cycles. Um, but, you know, whether we shift these vegetative rows by a month or sort of put partial part of the greenhouse in one month and part in another is really just uh, marginal changes around the edges. Um, so if we look at this, that essentially four months of the year we're in the vegetative state and the remaining eight months of the year we're in flower, we can then look at when is the sunlight gonna be sufficient to grow the plants without any light input and when are lights gonna be needed. And you know, as you can see here, you know, this center month, which represents July, uh, except for in the vegetative phase when the lights are on very early or very late to create that 18 hour day, we're running almost entirely on sunlight. And then uh, in those summer months when we're in the flower state, the lights never need to, the, the electrical lights never need to come on. Conversely, during the winter months when the sun angle is low, even in the middle of the day, electric lighting is required because the sunlight is insufficient to provide the energy that's needed for the plants. And so if we look at these in terms of one hour blocks and, and add them all up, uh, there are essentially 4,704 hours during the year in which light is needed for the plants. And out of that- Hey, Chris. Yes. Yep. I'm with you so far. I just want to make sure that the numbers I'm seeing in the columns, like 504 in January, that's mm -hmm. the number of hours of light. That's not kilowatt hours, for example. That's just 504 hours of light needed across the entire month of January. Correct. And that's based on a 28-day month, which accounts for a little sure. bit of time at the end of the life cycle when Got things it. get pushed over. So okay. yes, during during January, there are 504 hours, and these are hours of electric light. So as you can see in June, there's zero hours of electric light. Yeah. May, there's 56, and then going up to the largest numbers in the winter. And we'll talk about what that means in terms of kilowatt hours actually in just a moment. Um, and so uh, essentially out of those 4,700 hours, 2,128 hours can be provided with solely sunlight, uh, electric lights are turned off, and 2,576 hours are uh, when electric lights are on, and whether it's supplemental or not, when the lights are on, the lights are on, and they're, and they're consuming electricity. So we even when uh, the sun is out and the lights are on, we're still counting that as, as um, electric light energy. Hey, in June, if, the, if it's a cloudy, rainy day, are you running lights? Um, I am going to let John pipe in on that, so I don't... So, yeah, um, can you all hear me? Yeah, hear you just fine. Um, so, uh, traditionally, so we've already been running some of this stuff in, in the nursery. Obviously, we have lights in there. Um, <clears throat> in general, no. Um, there have been a few days. Um, this is an approximation uh, of general usage. Yes. Um, so, in general, no. It's not like, okay, there's some clouds or, okay, it's slightly rainy. Like, we don't necessarily turn on the lights then. I think really, um, it's really just those winter months where we're interested in turning on lights um, to help supplement growth 
and create robust flour. Okay. Yep, that makes sense to me. This is really kind of a seasonal average. Right, right. Yeah. So this, is, and, this is a general snapshot. It's not a, you know, like there's some error here or there, but this is sort of the approach. And the point is to sort of um, just visually show, um, <clears throat> you know, how, how this greenhouse is going to be used when those lights are going to be turned on. Essentially, you know, what months, are energy more energy intensive and, and what months are, are less energy intensive. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Um, and so then taking that schedule, um, we took, you know, part of the compliance with the state is that DMCTC had to get a mechanical engineer to prepare um, a, a pot, an energy certification letter. Um, and so the, you know, we can then apply uh, total lighting power number uh, when the greenhouse is fully built and the maximum amount of energy is being used um, and and essentially multiply that by the hours of lighting that are occurring. And that's what we see in this part of the letter. And so what we what we approximate is to run the facility, the total amount of lighting input, whether by sunlight or electric light, is that um, that total times the hours uh, which we get. So, so the sort of rough estimate that we were asked to come up with in terms of the total light input that the plants need is in the neighborhood of 923,000 kilowatt hours for the year. And then that divides into uh, how much of that required input is occurring just with sunlight so about 714,000 kilowatt hours, and how much is artificial lighting of about 505,000 kilowatt hours. Mm -hmm. And so what we come up with there is our best estimate um, would be that about 45% of the lighting energy required by the plants is being supplied by direct sunlight. Um, and then we also um, accounted for um, the existing ground-mounted solar array, which uh, I've estimated to be about a 10 kilowatt um, installation, ran that through Department of Energy calculator for the specific location in Waitley, um, and some assumptions about uh, the, the efficiency panels and spacing and that sort of thing, and expect that existing solar array to contribute about 12,500 kilowatt hours. Um, looking at the farmhouse roof where the proposal is to create another array, it appears as though we have enough space for about the same size of 10 kilowatt um, solar array. So an additional 12.5. And so each of those would contribute another one and a half percent of the total lighting energy, not the total electrical energy, but the total lighting energy required by the plants. Um, and so you add that up and, and just based on those rough calculations, we'd come up with something in the neighborhood of 48% of, of the energy, what, what I've been calling horticultural energy required by the plants um, to be um, uh, sort of contributed from the sunlight falling on the site, either directly or indirectly through the solar panels. And so that was our calculation, but um, there was, you know, certainly didn't, uh, hoped not to just ask you folks to take our word for it. Um, and so we also um, uh, came up with some industry data in the form of, um, of a report, uh, cannabis energy report uh, published by a group, New Frontier Data uh, down in Washington. Um, and they surveyed uh, cannabis cultivation facilities across the country. Um, they had responses from 81 individual cultivators uh, representing all 31 states where some form of cultivation is legal. Um, and this report goes into a lot of different things. Um, it looks at sites individually. It looks at the efficiency of different grow operations. It looks at the industry as a whole. It projects sort of future things. But, but for our purposes, what was uh, very useful is that um, they took information on actual energy consumption from these facilities and the amount of product being produced 
um, and uh, or, or in this case, uh, in the chart that we're looking at here, the um, square footage of the grow area, and then categorized those between indoor, which in this case means in a building, uh, closed off from the environment, a greenhouse, which in this case uh, includes, um, tip, and this is typical in the industry as a greenhouse, includes supplemental lighting, um, and then a true outdoor grow without any lighting, and looked at the energy usage uh, in kilowatt hours per year per square foot of grow. Um, and so this is sort of the key chart that we pulled out of that, which provides a range and an average for those different facilities so that we can compare them. Um, and so what, what the energy report shows is that for each square foot of grow in an indoor cultivation facility, um, the average facility is consuming about 262 kilowatt hours per year for each of those square feet. And then com uh, in comparison, the greenhouse grow is uh, around 133 kilowatt hours. And then, you know, sort of obviously, but also, you know, consistent with what you'd expect is that outdoor grow that's not using lighting is a very tiny fraction um, of, of the energy draw because all of their uh, light energy is coming directly from the sun. And again, sort of consistent with what DMCTC is predicting, um, the greenhouse itself with those contributions of sunlight runs at about half the energy consumption um, that you see in the indoor. Um, and, and then, you know, there's a couple other things to note about this chart and particularly on the greenhouse bar. So the X represents the mean of the data, the, the mathematical average, um, but it's also broken up into quartiles of grow operations. And so the median uh, runs at the, the uh, intersection of these two green bars and sort of the first and fourth quartile of the extended bars. So what I would just highlight here is, you know, in the indoor, it seems like there's a pretty nice bell curve distribution on that, which, which I guess kind of makes sense. In the, in the greenhouse case, there are clearly a handful of grow operations that are using a tremendous amount of energy that sort of pull that average up. And, you know, what I would say about that, again, yeah, I, I don't know the ins and outs of all of this stuff, but, any operation can waste a ton of energy if they try, um, I think is what you're seeing there. Um, but whether you look at the means or the medians, um, the, the trend here, the purpose of presenting this information was you know, to, to sort of corroborate some of the claims that we're making um, based on the own, our own schedule and projections. Hey, Chris? Yes. Just looking at that particular table, again, I'm curious about the temporal quantity here. You know, kilowatt hours per square foot is nice, but is that for unit kilowatt, like 133 kilowatt hours per day per so, square foot? Yeah, I mean, so you know, you suddenly start to get into megawatts per yeah. hour or day. So that is the annual, annual. energy consumption per square foot of grow. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it's I mean, amazing. Yes, if, that were, people, if that were for a shorter period not, of time, we're talking about a really, yeah, really yeah. enormous amount of energy. Yeah, that would be enormous. It just yeah. Chris, do you have? Yeah. Are you able to sort of identify geographic location of any of these specific places? Like, I would think obviously the latitude of the greenhouse would make a huge difference if it's. Yeah, it did. Like it, Canada, they're going to use a lot more light than if it's down in Arizona. Yeah. Just, um, it, that wasn't identified very clearly. Um, it was, you know, no surprise clustered in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they got a lot of responses from there. Um, there were, um, I think, Massachusetts, you know, it, it did break it down. Um, in states. I know there were at least a handful in Massachusetts, um, a few in Michigan. There's certainly some California. Um, and uh, I, the, this, is, you, this is specifically domestic, though, so it does not include information from Canada. I guess there wouldn't be too many in red states. So I was, I was almost going to say that, and I bit my tongue. <laughs> 
You're much um, so more yes. successful than I. <laughs> yeah, I would say generally speaking, um, most of these would be consistent latitude wise, but that's that's a sharp observation. Yeah, that's no, that's fair. That's very impressive set of data. Thank you very much. It's yeah. it's so yeah, and, and very, then very helpful. Uh, that's that's good. So we were hoping for, um, and then you know th this gets a little bit more into the qualitative hand wavy part of the presentation. But we did at least try to um, try to say something intelligent about the mechanical energy. So certainly in all of these facilities, electricity going to lights is the vast majority of the energy that's being used. Um, but mechanical energy is not zero, and particularly in the indoor case. There's a ton of energy that goes into cooling. Um, even in the cooler months of the year, the indoor facilities are using a lot of cooling to remove the heat produced by the lights and to condition the space for moisture um, because humidity uh, can create mold, which can instantly wipe out hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product. Um, so, so those controls are super important. Um, and so then, um, you at first glance, and, and my first thought was, well, you know, it, it, there should be a comparison here to be made um, in terms of where the energy intensity is going to be a little higher or lower for mechanical when you move to the greenhouse space. But it's really, there are some not obvious um, complications there. Um, and so what we can say is that you know, the, the cooling energy in a greenhouse is nearly zero um, because it's fans which draw very low energy com compared to, you know, sophisticated cooling systems uh, to just ventilate using the air. You know, wind patterns across the, the greenhouse will certainly complicate that. But then, you know, there, there's a heating load that's certainly higher than it is in the, in the indoor building. But even that's not quite so simple because in the greenhouse, the, the, the heat put off by the lights, um, even in the spring and fall where the, where the buildings are trying to get rid of that heat are really valuable to the greenhouse because then you don't really need to heat at all. Um, and in the winter months, we're using the lights more often um, as opposed to not in the summer. And that's when you need the heat the most. So that waste heat from the light, again, is beneficial. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's going to be a, a much higher heat loss when it's cold out in the greenhouse. But then again, it's complicated by the fact that um, during the day, we have sunlight coming in, creating the greenhouse effect, adding heat. At nighttime, we then supplement the insulation with the blackout curtains, which actually increase the R value during the very times when the heat loss is going to be lowest. So, you know, once we got into this, it was a little complicated to say anything definitively. So, you know, sort of the conclusion here is to, again, sort of come back to this chart, which is looking at, you know, energy use overall and noting that you know, in our site specific case, we were seeing lighting energy roughly half um, uh, coming from the sun. And if that's true, then the fact that total energy is running somewhere around half of the indoor case where all of the energy input is artificial, you know, it logically follows that, you know, mechanical energy usage is within shouting distance of half of what you would uh, use in an indoor grow, where again, the embodied energy of the plant uh, product coming out of the indoor grow is 100% artificial. Um, and so what we would say is that lighting energy, mechanical energy, energy in total, the embodied energy of, uh, of a plant coming out of a greenhouse is a little bit less than half due to sunlight. Um, not, you know, not quite 50% for sure, we'll, we'll admit that, um, but, but certainly in the ballpark. Um, and then, you know, lastly, um, ad addressing with more specificity uh, the questions of are there more opportunities on site to, to get us up to what we think would, be, you know, from, from the 46 to 48% up to the 50% that the bylaw is looking for. Excuse me. Just a second. Mm -hmm. Sorry, he kept talking and talking a little too much. Um, and the reality is that on, on to start with the Seven River Road site itself, 
um, there are regulatory constraints that really prevent us from doing very much more. And I'll pull up the, uh, the site plan here um, uh, and the larger scale version of it. Um, and so uh, the zoning bylaw allows rooftop solar and up to 10 kilowatt uh, array of ground mounted solar by right in all districts. Um, and so uh, again, farmhouse proposal is to do that, you know, assuming we don't need steel reinforcement of, of the roof or anything to hold it up. Um, so that would be by right, no problem. The, there's an existing barn on the site that we do not feel is structurally sufficient to be uh, putting a significant solar array on it. And then we've got um, the, the zoning division between AR1 and AR2 comes into play. So that runs right along this fence line here with everything close to the road in AR1. In AR1, ground mount above uh, 10 kilowatt hours not allowed. So, so none of this land, which would be, you know, feasible to put it on there is just not, not allowed from a zoning standpoint. And then the remainder of the property in AR2 is being used uh, in one of four different ways. Um, a lot of the land obviously is being used for the marijuana crop, which is not conducive to a dual use situation because it really needs um, as much direct sunlight as it can possibly get. You know, usually you're looking for crops more like a broccoli or a lettuce or, you know, obviously uh, uh, hay fields and things like that can be used. And all the remaining non-crop land is either in a zoning setback, it is wetland, which is certainly a no-go to build anything, and uh, or it's within the 25-foot buffer, which historically the Conservation Commission has held as a no disturb on sites like these. So, you know, the, the conclusion is on, on the Seven River Road, uh, we don't think that it's allowable to do significantly more than that. Um, and then, you know, the, the board did um, bring up the question of other DMCTC properties. Um, Three River Road is quite problematic. Um, it's in AR1, so ground mount is a no-go, except for uh, a potential 10 kilowatt. But even in that case, um, anywhere on this property, we're either um, in a zoning setback, uh, we're potentially in Hatfield, which has its own complications. Um, we're outside of the area leased to DMCTC, um, and so then we're, or we're um, um, uh, in sort of active uses of the site. Um, and, you know, in terms of, not sure what that was. Um, and then we're getting some reverberation. Yeah, I've got, I've got too many machines going here. Oh, Judy's on two different machines. That's why. Okay. Got it. Is it okay, it's, it's okay now, right? <laughs> yes, no. it sounds fine now. No, one um, of your machines needs to be muted, Judy. Oh, yeah. You got that again. Totally off. Okay. <laughs> um, and so that leaves the building itself, which has its own challenges, uh, because the, the largest portion of this building is an old, what they call Butler building, pre-engineered to be just barely enough to stand up to code. And then um, let's just say the previous, the, the landowner has modified the building in a way where we're not yet sure what needs to be done to make it structurally sound per modern codes. Um, so doing anything with that building is highly questionable. Um, there's still the possibility that if DMCTC wants to use it, they're going to either have to knock it down or do major, major renovations. Um, so that's just not really um, anything that we can commit to. Um, and then to just, you know, for, for completeness, we did address in the letter, the, the board mentioned the property on state um, state road. Um, and so, uh, you know, what, what I'll say there in terms of DMCT's response to that suggestion is they're obviously going to seriously consider putting solar on that site just as, as good business. Um, it does seem like it's got the, the potential for that, um, but they're not prepared to commit 
to a solar array on that. And, you know, our, our position formally would be that uh, we don't feel that that's um, consistent with the, with the language of being on site in the bylaw. Um, but certainly, obviously, we're in a hearing and can, can discuss that further. So that's um, my, as usual, exhaustive uh, answer to some of the questions that, that the board has raised. And we're certainly um, uh, happy to get into any of the details if desired. So what's the protocol, Don, at this point? Well, does anybody have questions on this? I would think it's a starting place. I don't have any questions. I, I, though I suppose I'll just ask this one. If you could just roll back to the very top of your, your energy efficiency narrative. I, I just, I do wanna say, and this is sort of both to you, Chris, and to your employer, the MCTC, that this has, I think, been a remarkably well done piece of analysis, um, very thorough, very helpful. I think for me, the takeaway that this kind of use of, use of greenhouses, this combination you're doing on this parcel of a lot of outdoor cultivation, no use of energy or minimal use of energy, plus some now use of greenhouses to supplement that is a far more, it sort of, meets, in my personal view, the, the spirit of the bylaw and trying to encourage energy efficiency as compared to a true fully enclosed indoor cultivation operation 24 seven by 365. I just did wanna know, like if you roll down to some of your numbers, I kind of just wanted to get a, like a, a kind of a number like in, kilowatt hours in the month of January. Like I wanted to just have a sense for your facility. Like at the end of a call, your, your, your normalized 28 day month in January, like how many kilowatt hours would you be yeah. expending in that month? And it really just because like I know for my own house, it's a residence, so it's, it's very apples to apples, but I'm like, I know I go through in an all electric house a megawatt in January, you know? Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to have a sense of scale of yeah. like what I use in a month to what this facility might use in. And that would just help me see this a little bit more viscerally, if you will. Sure. Um, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna dangerously calculate on the fly. That's um, fine. So I, I'm not gonna hold you, this is not a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, so 504 hours of lighting during that month. Right. Um, and uh, if all the lights are on full blast, our, um, our energy certification letter tells me that's about 196,000 watts. So 196 um, kilowatts per hour. Yeah. And so I'm coming up with, yeah. So if, you're, if your house is a megawatt, I'm coming up with 98. 98 so. megawatts. So in a month. Yeah, so 90, like 98, like 100 times, like a single residence. But again, again, very different, but that's, that's, I mean, that doesn't seem, because one of the things that I think, and I was looking back at minutes of past meetings, I don't wanna you know, take up too much airtime on this, but it seemed like one of the motivations behind this part of the bylaw was this concern about, indoor cultivators and their energy demands placing an undue burden on the electric grid. And it seems to me that, you know, a hundred megawatts is not, I mean, it seems like a large number, but not a crazy large number if you think about other things, whether it's Yankee Candle or other things going on around town. So it, it, it assuages my concerns that this shift the horticultural lighting during these periods of time or creating a, the, the kinds of things we worry about from zoning about health and safety and general welfare, uh, welfare and so forth. And, and, you know, and I think you did allude to a point that, you know, I didn't, I didn't even include this. I think I had a throwaway line about this in the letter. I didn't want to 
act like we were relying on this because it really is treated separately in the bylaw. But if we look at sort of per pound of, uh, of product that will be produced by this property as a whole and incorporate all of the outdoor fields, um, you know, and, and if we consider that those fields are relying 100% on sunlight, you know, I, I, I do think that that, uh, as you say, that, that um, I was about to say puts the puts things in a different light, but that would be a pun. I don't want to go there. <laughs> that would be a good one. Well, I was the one who raised the big concern about this last time because I know that when we drafted the bylaw, we were very concerned that cultivation was just going to raise energy consumption in a time when um, this necessar wasn't necessarily the best thing. Um, I think I'm very, I was concerned when you said, well, you know, greenhouses use less because in fact, the bylaw is expressed as a percentage of use. So, so that wasn't a whole lot of help for me, but this, this analysis does, does show it's almost 50%. And um, I, I'm pleased to see it. I had a, expected people to argue this earlier and nobody ever did. So uh, my, my compliments. Chris, I've got a question. Um, if commercial power goes down, do you guys have any kind of a uh, backup generator in, in your plan? I again have to defer to John because I don't think I have a large generator accounted for. I don't know. Um, if they, I imagine you have some sort of um, backup for at least there's security uh, items that I think have to be uh, available even in power outage. But John, can you right. weigh in on that? Yeah, I can weigh in on that. Um, the answer, the short answer is no. If the lights go down, then that's not great for our crop. I mean, we would basically probably have to rent so if it was a moment where we needed lights, we'd probably have to rent a generator and, and put some put some personnel lighting in there just to keep the plants from flipping. Um, but right now, no, there's not there's not a backup generator for those lights. Well, and since it was mentioned, what about for the security part of it? The security there is a backup generator. We are we can't be operational or licensed without uh, a backup generator for our security cameras. So if the power goes down, our lights go off, but our cameras stay on and they're able to see in the dark as well. Good. And that, that energy draw is tiny compared to the yeah. lights. Yeah. So it's a small. Okay, thanks, John, Chris. All right, I guess, um, do we need to do a vote on this? Um, well, we need to close the public hearing. Yeah, we would have to close the public hearing and make sure nobody off the board. I mean, there are other people now in the meeting, so maybe they're all part of DMCTC. But I guess once we close the public hearing, I've got a draft of um, approval conditions that we that I can share my screen and we can talk about after we close the public hearing. Okay, well, is there anyone, I can't see everybody who's on line, but is there anyone that not part of the planning board who has any questions? Uh, hearing none, I will close the public hearing. Okay. At all right, so let me share my screen here. Um, so what I did is I'm assuming that we're treating this as a you know, kind of a brand new from scratch site plan review uh, and, and that it would replace previous site plan approvals. Is that accurate, Judy? Not entirely because this previous site plan approval includes the outdoor fields. It does. Well, it would 
But I think I guess should the, just apply. Well, I guess the question would be, Judy, is it's, it, my impression was that we would create a, I looked back at the original set of conditions and thought that we would be kind of building a brand new set of approval conditions that carries over any still valid conditions that were there previously. So we don't have to have like two different approvals from two different dates that people have to like adjudicate between. But now it's just this one final document that is the up-to-date approval conditions. Does that make sense? It does, but it's not consistent with the way things have been done in the past. I don't, um, and it essentially forces us to discuss everything. Did, have you commented, I mean, so what I can have you like, highlighted what's what would be new and what isn't. Yeah, well, let me. I mean, um, it would be much simpler just to take to say previous conditions. In in well, the. Yeah, I mean, I think approval. Yeah, you'd, such and such. you'd want to Still cite the previous approval for sure, so that there's no ambiguity when someone goes to review the site plan approval yeah. in the future. Um, yeah. So what I can, what I have here, the, um, I I would really think we should start. We should just say, in addition to the previous conditions, the current conditions apply, or something like that. Do that. Is that what you you concur with that, Don? Yes, definitely. Okay. So what I'm going to do, let me just. This will make it easier for me to just flip flip back and forth. Just I'll just refresh people's recollection. Let me show you what the conditions were. So these were the conditions that we <coughs> approved in November of 2020. Um, this condition no longer makes any sense like to be carried forward. This is modified. This condition still remains in effect, this prohibition on this particular marijuana variety. Um, we had landscape planning, so we had various things like this. And so you're thinking we just say, in addition to all of this, with meaning that we're saying, in addition to things that really are now outdated, we're going to add new conditions. Is that what you're recommending, Judy? Essentially, yes. And I, I think that what I would say is, and the, the lighting one is probably the most significant, is that that condition would need to be vacated because yes. we're specifically allowing yes. the lighting. Um, yes. So I think we'd request that be a condition of the new approval so there's no ambiguity about that in the future. All right, well, tell you what, I'll swap to, this was the draft I was preparing for tonight that we would agree on the wording and then this gets attached to our site plan, our signed site plan approval document. So we always have this on. Um, I assume we still want to have a condition that you know, you are shielding the horticultural lighting from exterior view at night. Um, so I don't know if I'm deleting this one because I copied this from the previous. I'm happy to delete this clause if people feel like, um, maybe I think- No, you're because we still have, see, this is why you want the old one except where it's, Okay. Um, this this was primarily related to the outdoor cultivation. So, in a so you want language, Judy, that says I, I'd like a whole new. I want a whole new sheet, like we start with normally. Yeah, I it's, thought that was what I was proposing. Um, and so, what this would be the whole new sheet, and then we can pick and choose. What we carry a blank over. whole new a blank whole new sheet. Okay, <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't well, tell from this. You know, well, hold on, Judy. What I did, new. what the language here is language that I've drafted earlier today 
in advance of tonight's meeting, think of his language I'm proposing we put on a blank page. If you want, I'll hide all of this so you don't even see it. It looks blank, <laughs> but the words are available if we want to pull them up. All right. What I'm suggesting is that we always would put on the new, put on the blank page. The plan must receive approvals from all appropriate boards and committees. So yes or no on that. I don't think there are any other boards and committees to opine on this. this okay, this, and we I don't to. know. Uh, Chris may may know. It doesn't involve the part Board of Health. The the ZBA is signed off. Heath is signed off. There's, well, isn't this just boilerplate anyway? So if there aren't, that's fine too. It was, I mean, it's, it's all appropriate, so I don't think we have an objection to it, but you're right. I mean, and, and even as far as the building department's concerned, we had approval for the greenhouses site plan anyway, but I, I have no problem with that condition because it just says for all appropriate boards and okay. committees. It was just boilerplate. Happy to delete it. Show of hands to keep. Well, I, th I think Judy's idea of keeping the existing plan and then we can say as of this meeting or so, the following uh, restrictions and conditions. Following changes or following additions or changes apply. Yeah. We start with the approval. So, um... Give me language. So this document that we're creating here is going to be attached to the signed site plan approval that we give to DMCTC. So why don't why doesn't somebody tell me how you would like this to start? I think that's a good start. And now you have some other things that you think need to go in there. So why don't we go down to those and talk to them. Okay, all right. I, I would change conditions subject to the following conditions. I would say um, the site plan approval date at September 27, 2022 remains in effect subject to the following um, changes and additions. So the site plan approval so this I mean, is not coming? right. So the this is badly worded. The uh, site plan dated. This is the date of the site plan submitted to the planning board by DMCTC for this review. Okay. What we need to start with is the, a reference to the previous site plan approval for the project. Okay. We can find the date after. I can question. give me one second here. In fact, I'm sharing my screen so you can see everything. So, so, something that says subject to the following amendments. Approved sub subject to the following amendments, colon, and then the condition, the new conditions. Okay, so let me just hold okay. that thought. Just hold that thought for a second, Tom. Um, I want to see if this, this is not the one. It didn't have the right naming convention back then, or we didn't, oh, here it is, site plan approval signed. Okay. All right, so this, we originally approved we approved the original site plan on August 25th, 2020. Okay. And these were the conditions that we put in there. So, so what we're saying, you want language that says some refers to the site plan approval dated August 25th, 2020. Is that correct? That's the application. We approved it in, in November, if you go down farther. Well, the date. The date of the approval though was. I see. So this was date received by the planning board, November. Yeah. 
So the site, yeah, this is bad wording, but the November approval 11, was on November 24th, 2020. Okay. November 24th, 2020. All right. So what we're saying is that um, the site plan approval dated November. Twenty fourth, twenty twenty, is amended with the following conditions. Is that what we're looking for? No, no. Is no. It is remains in effect subject to the following amendments. Right. Thank you. Okay. Do we want to date that the following amendments um, on and the date of the, of the amendment? November 20. Made. No, that'd be tonight. 29. Like that, Tom? Yes. So, so that we've got the two dates squared away. Site plan. That's normally at the bottom of the signature, isn't it? The date. Doesn't matter. It's not over that. Yeah, remains in effect subject to the following amendments made on November 29, 2022. Okay, so um, I think we're modifying the horticultural lighting because it in the original one, as you can see, it said it shall be used only in the nursery and shall be shielded from. So it's no longer used only in the nursery, all right? So I'm thinking we're just saying horticultural lighting shall be shielded from exterior view at night, okay? And is, and is allowed in all greenhouses. All, I, I, in fact, I wouldn't mention the shielded from exterior view at night because that was there before. We just say horticultural lighting will be permitted in all greenhouses. One second here. Horticultural lighting is allowed, is permitted in all greenhouses. Okay. Um, what was this, Chris, about the, this is the original wording about exterior lighting and exterior security cameras. Did you have an issue with that? No, that's all still applicable. Okay. All right, so we're not worrying about that. We're not worrying about the prohibition. We're not worrying about the odor issues. We're not worrying about the archeological artifacts. Um, yeah, well, I mean, you've, oh, what else? I mean, you've revised the plan. Actually, I think before we go to the horticultural lighting, we should, we should say that the site plan is based on the plan sub submitted on the date you had before. Yeah. The site. Oh, um, go ahead. Please, Chris, help me. This, this, yeah, I'm looking at it now. The, um, the effective site plan will be that of September 20th. Yeah, I'm trying to find it myself. So my pages are jumping around. Um, as, as built, as built. Construction will be consistent with the site plan. You're really making this challenging, Judy. Why don't we be as well? Good. What I want to say is they're going to do it subject to the site plans that has been submitted with with the original one and and the 
driveway amendments and driveway and planning amendments. Yep. So, so that would be yeah. the. So what we, uh, with the application, we submitted a plan set dated August 9th of this year. And then, um, I'm sorry, uh, I'm so sorry, sorry. No, 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 September 27th. I saw that date before. I'm yeah. getting myself mixed up. September 27th of this year was the date of the full set that came with the application. Right. And the sheets that I gave you with the driveway amendments are revised as of November 17th. And revisions as of November 17th. Right. Like that. I agree with that. Okay. All right. Efforts will be made to add solar to the solar, so roof mounted solar to be added to the farmhouse subject to structural integrity of the building. That sounds fine to me. Roof mounted solar array to be installed on the where? Farmhouse. On the farmhouse subject to structural integrity. Of the building. Integrity of the building. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's subject to the integrity of the building, not an analysis of the building. Yeah. Well, obviously, you have to do that, but. Um, and actually, there was one other minor thing that we raised last time, and I think it was discussed briefly. The plans call for a guard booth. At present, we have not built that. Um, and uh, I think we'd prefer that that component um, be uh, essentially subject to the, the police department's approval as to whether or not it is needed. I'm still struggling on this one. But, Sorry. Uh, I was sort of half listening to that. Okay, I'll, let's finish this one and then I'll. Yeah, I'm sorry. Branch, um, um, so it's installed on the farmhouse um, if the structural integrity permits. I, I like that. Uh, yeah, not my favorite guard word. House, guard house only to be required if required, guard house only to be built if required by the police department. The Waitley Police Department? Yeah. That's what Chris said. Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. Oh, please. I don't have anything else. That looks complete to me. Um, yeah, yeah, that, that looks complete to me. 
Do we need to put anything uh, on there about the changes in the driveway? That's covered in the amend the revised plans. Okay. I think. Yeah, so the, the plan, the revised plans we submitted um, sh show the driveway for our understanding of the requirements. Um, is that noted on the on the plan, Chris? Uh, so the plan, it uh, it doesn't refer to the driveway requirements, but it applies them uh, with a revised layout. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, I've saved that in our drive, so we can, okay. I'll move, I'll move site plan approval subject to those conditions. I'll second. Second. All right. Um, any other comments? A roll call vote, Don, yes, Sarah? You can't vote, Don. You, you didn't. Uh, sit through the, a lot of the previous hearing. Uh, is that true? That may be true. Okay. Unless unless you've listened to the recording and signed an affidavit. I just looked at uh, minutes. All right. Um, scroll call vote. Sarah. Yes. Grant. Yes. Um, yes. And Judy. Yes. Uh, the motion passes. Great. Appreciate your time. Well, right. Thank you for the extra work. It's much appreciated. All right. So as usual, um, I'll work with Don to get all the documents signed and scanned and alert you when what you might want to pick up physically is available to be picked up. Sounds good to me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, right. Chris. Have a good night. I should warn you, I have to leave at 6.30 because I have to do a presentation at town meeting tonight. Oh, well, that's right, tonight's town meeting. Okay, we're gonna take up proposed amendments to the subdivision regulations. Next. Right. Judy, are you gonna, how are we gonna do this, especially if you're gonna have to bolt? Well, if you could share them, I don't think it'll take too long. Yeah, okay. So I think, let me just. I thought I had sent them around, but. Well, I've, got, uh, I've got a copy here if you want me to share it. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, do you have the one that I marked up? Because I put a couple of changes in. Request. Just a reminder of what we're doing. We, um, while you're doing that, um, we amended the form A a while ago to deal with the number of electronic copies we wanted. And in doing that, I realized that, that there was that APR provision in the form A and that we had never gone back to the subdivision regulations and inserted that there. And since the application is supposed to be a kind of a reduced form version of the regulations, I figured we better fix it. And that's what this is aimed at doing. So it has both the changes in the copies and the wording in part C, which is, um, is essentially the, the wording from the policy. So this will be the same one that got posted on the town website. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, unless it's the one that Rand amended. Well, this is not the one that I amended. Okay. And and, and so and I'm not sure if obviously I just amended it within the last hour or so. So no, well, that's all right. Oh, we need to open the public hearing. Good idea. Okay, next point on the agenda is we're going to open a public hearing on proposed amendments to the subdivision regulations, pages six and seven. Public hearing. And, it, and I'm ready to share the version that I marked up if, if that would be helpful. 
fine. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. I'll share that. Uh, here's, okay, very good. And I really only did a, one thing was obvious because that, the, that part hadn't been deleted that I'm highlighting, so I just deleted it. So it's clear it's four paper copies. Um, there was a missing, I believe, Judy, there was a missing word, shall. Yeah, shall or, shall or must. Yeah, I noticed that. So I put that in. And then, you know, always I, since we uh, made sure that we indicated that APR was an abbreviation of agricultural preservation restriction. And then just going back to the top, because I used to work at UMass, I suggested changing the word, the pronoun his to their, just to allow, to try to be more gender neutral, unless only people who identify as male might be involved in submitting these things. So. The one thing I would like people to do is to look at the original language in part C, which seemed to me to be redundant with with the first with paragraph A. Okay. So. And so where I think I put one sentence from that into paragraph. I can't I'm having trouble reading this on the iPad. I apologize. Um I have the okay. So I put the added the filing fee, which was in here, C. So and Judy. I didn't see anything else. So I wanna make sure we haven't taken anything out that should be there. That's... So you had, if, then I, if I understand you correctly, so you've deleted this reference to the general law and to article one. And instead, you're just referring to, you know, sort of the subdivision control law. And that was deliberate on your part. You don't feel that specific reference that I'm highlighting here is needed in the new language? I didn't, but it would be easy enough to move it up there. It would be easy to move it up there. Yeah, probably, maybe. In parens, following this statement, subdivision control yeah. law in parens. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you're suggesting, and I can just do this in real time. Um, or maybe the other way around, um, as defined in, I think it's probably the other way around, as defined in mass general laws, such and such and such, and watch the sub control. And then put the subcontrol law there in Article One of these regulations. Does not require. So you're thinking under is at the risk of. Uh, oh. I actually. Oh. Oh. Does Judy. Matter which way it goes? Doesn't matter which way it goes. Subcontrol law, I think, is Mass General Law Forty One. <laughs> so does not chapter 41 section 8 whatever it is 811 must be the sub control law does not require approval so this would suggest that that original language is important, that it really would be any person who believes that their plan does not show a subdivision as defined in general law, blah, 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 may submit. So, so maybe what you're thinking is that their plan 
does not, I'm going to just for the sake of argument, put in brackets text that we may delete. And then after does not show a subdivision as defined in G L C 41. And I'll have to find that special section character. Just copy it. Well, copy it. it won't let me copy as it's as long as it's marked as deleted text. So I'd have to undelete it, which I could. Write out section. SEC period. Yeah. <laughs> 41 section 89. So okay, one more under the word articles that you've just got highlighted. You've got another his instead of there, directly below that. His used to be they. Oh, let me submit. They are a plan. All right, so we're temp we're we're thinking we're going to strike that. Just so you can see, let's just look at simple markup. So this is what it looks like without all the confusing markup. And I guess, Judy, that if there's a section A here, this should be changed to B if we're deleting B? No, there is a B there. I didn't, oh. these are just changes. I see, okay. There is a paragraph B, but there That's, were no changes in that. Okay. So this was, this here is the proposed new section A. Any person who wishes to, wishes to cross. These are the two paragraphs with proposed changes. There's something about this that just makes me feel a comma needs to go after the word approval. That the otherwise it's one reading is the plan does not require approval on a filing fee. <laughs> Where do you want the comma? Yeah, I'm just it's it's just a very, very worried sentence. It would be after the word approval to show that the plan does not require, accompanied by the necessary evidence to show that the plan does not require approval, comma, and a filing fee of $50. I agree with that, and I'm a grammar Nazi. Okay, you, you yeah. agree with the comma? Yes. Okay. Back up in the first sentence, I'm just wondering, is it necessary to have of these regulations? Or, and Article One may submit their plan. No, because that re does recur, uh, refer both to the g general laws and our regulations. Yeah, it, it, we're, we're citing two places where it is. Yeah, because when we go to Article One, that regulation is in there. Yeah, as defined in this and that. Right. And do we really need, why do we need four paper copies? Do we need four? Have we been getting two more copies than we need? I guess maybe that was with- That's, We went through this when we did 4MA. This is okay. consistent with 4MA. I don't want to have to go back and then- Okay, that's fine. Again. Okay, got it. Well, we, we, do, we do use four because the assessor gets one, the clerk gets one, and we get one in the- um, okay. Sounds good. CYA. 
or maybe B. I move we close the public hearing. Do I have a second? I'll second that. The public hearing is closed. As uh, I lost the time. 625. 25. Okay. So now we have to have a vote on these. these. To approve the changes. Okay. All right. So I will make, well, Judy, this is your baby. Go ahead, make the motion. I move we approve the changes. As and I'll second that. As amended. As amended. Okay, any further discussion? We are not a call for a roll call vote. Don, yes. Sarah? Yes. Grant? Yes. Tom? Yes. Judy? Yes. Motion is approved unanimously. Thank you. All right. I'd like to leave the meeting. Um, you have my comments on Mary's minutes. Um, so thank you very much. See you tonight. All right, good luck. Thanks. Okay. All right. So what's next? So we're just doing minutes is the last item on our agenda. Yes, sir. All right. And this is, uh, so I looked at, I looked at Mary's minutes. I looked at the revisions. I didn't initially have any revisions. I've looked at what uh, the changes that Judy has made and they look good to me. Pop that up, please. I'm sorry, what was that? Um, share your screen for that. Sure, okay, let me do that. I don't have one right here, do that. There we go, share screen, draft minutes. Now, all right, I've I've turned up. Let me turn all the uh, the markup display back. Where's my? Show all markup. <coughs> there we are. So there's all markup. Um, so Mary, you had a yellow, and this. This actually is, yeah, that was that was what I was talking about, the, the lot. That number refers to, of square feet refers to the size of the lot? Yeah, you know. Okay. On the plan, that was what was there. I'm going to remove the yellow highlighting. Uh, I think I was just observing that the, the lot has a very strange like peninsula <laughs> that I thought was there, not for any real use, but simply to add some square footage to the, to the lot so that it would meet the minimum of 60,000 square feet. Which it also, it also gives you uh, more frontage further along on Route 5. Oh, uh, okay, maybe because yeah, because when they when they originally put that in there, they did that on purpose. Okay, interesting to know. All right, so so we looked at that. Um, I think you know Mary's been doing a great job capturing all of this. Um, and I think Judy made a. I think a good call at some of these things that were discussed is really, really just more about informing Larry who arrived late to the meeting. So Judy proposed striking that from the minutes. I agree with that. And then the rest of this was the opening of the public hearing. And um, and I think now, Judy, um, I'm, I'm sorry, not Judy, Mary, for the yellow highlighting, um, this is the 
this is the definition of indoor marijuana cultivation. Right. I, I thought that I would need to put in the section that it came from, and I had trouble finding that when I went looking for it. So I, I said, I'm never going to get these out of here if I don't just send it. If it's okay. fine just to say, read the definition, that's great. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the whole bylaw, that whole part of the bylaw is 171-28.6. Is that what you were looking for? Right. 171-28.6. Yeah. 171-28.6. Okay. That's the marijuana bylaw. I think we did. Yeah, like I said, I look, looked it all over. Uh, we'll look at the next change that Judy suggested. I remember her bringing up that point. <clears throat> Okay, that's fine. All right. Oh, oh, I guess you moved that bit about Larry Brotherton down. Right. To... Okay. And we did do that. Didn't want me to do that. I approved a bunch of minutes. Okay. All right. Well, I would move that we accept the approve the minutes as amended by Judy. I will second that. What the heck? What was that, Don? Tom has seconded. Okay. Any further discussion? And then I'll call for a vote. Don, yes. Sarah? Yes. Yes. Tom? Yes. The motion passes. Okay. We could be done. I have nothing else. I will accept a motion to adjourn. Oh, wait, are, Sarah. Are Mike and Lisa here for a reason? Hey, this is a great place to hang out, Sarah. <laughs> we are fascinating. <laughs> I mean, come on. Do you know people like watch our videos? Um, we are just starting to get to the point where we are poking our nose into as many different areas as we can, knowing that we have um, our own struggle uh, that we are going to be in the middle of. So that was what we were doing. And I wasn't sure today was treatment for me. So I did not have an opportunity to really go through what was on your agenda. Um, and I guess really the only thing that I'm going to be looking for at some point is to find out, you know, who's responsible for motivating Jim Hawkins and um, whether or not he needs help putting together information to work off of. Yeah, interesting. But I think we have that going through Brian and I think we're okay at the moment. Are you just out of curiosity, are you alluding to the what's going on on uh, Chestnut Plain Road? Or are you oh, talking yes. about a different struggle? No, Chestnut Plain Road. And Lisa, are they still running uh, dump trucks up and down that road? Oh, yes. And actually today, Mike put together some numbers uh, in regards to what we have figured out because we have, um, we have cameras on our property uh, to watch for critters because we have bears that come through and it happens to catch part of the road. So we keep track and have been keeping track of the numbers of trucks. And right now, I think we are in the vicinity of a, 
of about 4,500 cubic yards of material that have been brought up top and with it involving the, um, the uh, watershed and everything else, we don't know for sure where that's coming from. And so we have, we have things that we just continue to do because you know everybody else for the most part is out of the loop in regards to listening to this starting at 7, 7.30 in the morning and the yeah. trucks and I the boxes banging <laughs> when they're empty coming off the hill and <coughs> what they're doing. Um, Lisa, so um, with I, thought, I thought I heard that Jim Hawkins has issued a cease and desist order. That would be news to us, and that would be welcome news. But no, well, no, that I, is I, not I, what we see going on. Your your knowledge is more accurate than mine. We and were hoping for yeah. uh, we were hoping for a cease and desist until this gets resolved. But the only thing that I know that has been um, stopped at this moment is we have not heard anything about the other company that wants to um, come in to do things. So we have been working on researching the permits and what the permits, um, what was applied for in the permits, number one and number two, what was granted. Uh, we have the original application for the site when it was first put together. We have the, um, The, the what, Mike? That was your father's? Oh. The, the original? Yeah, the original, the original one that my father did back in 81. Right. We have that permit and we have that application. That is not showing anything in regards to what is currently going on. The one that we have not found, and I am actually going to go down to the town offices tomorrow to look for because Amy has plenty of other things to do is the permit for when the building went in up there and to see if there was anything in addition to the building that was allowed because we do know at this point um, they are planning on using the sites that they are creating parking lots up there for um, for storing all of their road construction equipment which has nothing to do with what that permit was designed to be for. Yeah. And has this been reviewed under the Aquifer Protection Bylaw? By the ZBA? I'm sorry? Has this been reviewed? Uh, by they, have, they have basically said that there is nothing that they can do at the moment that Jim Hawkins is in a position to um, enforce what is going on. And I'm not sure how motivated he is or what he's using for information to work off of because the first time he approached them quite a while back he asked them if their permit covered what was going on and they said yes it does and it wasn't until we said no it doesn't I think that it has been revisited and now from what I understand my husband a week ago, two weeks ago, got an email from um, Brian saying that the town is involved now, the lawyers are involved. And so there are people working on this, but um, you know, it's still going on. So mm -hmm. we, we've had, you know, he put together some numbers today to make sure they understand that, you know, this is still going on. We watched a truck pull out of the driveway without stopping and pulled right out in front of a car one day. Yeah. We have one driver who is just a jerk. <laughs> There's three drivers right now that are working full time and one of them is an idiot. But, you know, that's neither here nor there. We're just working on trying to find out what's going on with this material and that the property is used for what it was set up to be used for and nothing else. Thank you. It's been a little unsettling to see these emails and I'm seeing basically your husband's side of the correspondence, you know. He works, he works from home. Yeah, he works from home. He has he has a it is it is a high pressure job to begin with. And the windows for his office 
are facing the road and he sees the end of the driveway and this yeah. is all we listen to is the trucks coming yeah. down off the hill up the hill on the road out of the road it's just and for me unfortunately on a personal level um you know with me and my treatment i have days where i have nights that are not good so i try and rest during the day this trucks this does four, not over four thousand yards of material yeah he's figured out it's been over 800 trucks up and down yeah, yeah. and just because so, we're only, you know, only it, seeing it, this it one side it, you know we don't know whether mike is getting responses from brian or others or if it's just a lonely voice shouting into the no, board. at this point, I think they're getting very frustrated because I think we have made enough noise now and we've let some people know what's going on, that there are multiple people that are contacting the town on a regular basis to find out what's going on. We do have a website that is set up because that is what my husband does. And every time we get new information from anywhere, it gets put on the website. We do have a place for emails to be submitted. So if um, people want to be notified. There are updates on the website. We can send out emails saying there's updates, you know, take a look and see. But there hasn't been really anything for a couple of weeks that we've gotten from the town. So we're now that the Thanksgiving is over again, we're back at it. Okay. All right. Well, as I did tell fun. Mike via email that if we wants to talk about what future planning board activities could be to deal with these things you know if yeah if really you know, in the future, it's, but, but this it, is not this, the time yeah yeah no and i think that truly i think that this is such a an isolated case i don't see how this could pop you know any real changes could possibly make a difference down the road you know this just has to be resolved and i think once this is resolved you know, there's not many other places where there where there's any attempt to do anything like this that I have seen or heard of from anybody in town. Thank you for the. So, but that's it. All right. All right. On a personal motion to adjourn. No. Uh, yeah, I think we've already done that. Oh, OK. Oh, no, I guess we didn't. But on a personal note, um, I now have a great granddaughter. Woo! Congratulations, Don. Congratulations. Yeah, all right. Well, have to, you have to send it around. It's going to be a little yeah, hard to it's see. It's not coming through yeah. very good. Yeah, it's not coming through too well. But oh, we believe you. We got the shininess. I'll, uh, I'll send an email around. Sounds Thanks. wonderful. All right. Congratulations, Don. We uh, we did. Did we do a, a roll call? I don't think so. We. I don't think so. All right. So we have a motion to adjourn. Second. Uh, and seconded. Don, yes. Sarah. Yes. Grant. Yes. Thank and you. Tom. Yes. The meeting is adjourned. All right. Um, Night all.